Good evening to us all. Uh, we are all welcome to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I'm Professor George Obiej. And I have the honor to introduce us all to this evening's wonderful program. So I'll begin by uh, saying, um, Madam Presi the President of the Academy, past presidents of the Academy, vice presidents of the Academy, fellows of the Academy, His Royal Majesty Noche Professor Ninote Owo the Fourth, delegates and elders, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Of course, our young colleagues and friends from the schools, we are all welcome. Now, I'd like to say that on behalf of fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is Ghana's premier learned society, uh, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this year's lecture in the sciences. Kindly also uh, take note that uh, this event is being streamed live on the Academy Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook platforms. The Academy's annual lectures in the sciences and humanities commenced in the year 1993. This was to provide the Academy with an additional platform on which fellows could take turns in addressing topical issues in the humanities and the sciences. And some of the topics addressed in the sciences uh, the last five years, I will list a few. Stress and rest, pharmacodynamic modulation for sustainable health. So a lecture delivered by Professor Arthur Sakifio, the Foundation Dean of the School of Pharmacy, University of Ghana, Legon. Plants and Human Development was a lecture delivered by Professor GKS Aflakwi, the former rector of Wa Polytechnic. Is Ghana on the brink of ecological suicide? Was a lecture delivered by Professor Rosima Mama Enchuamensa, former direct, deputy director general of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Biodiversity conservation, genetic resources, gene sequencing, and the Nagoya Protocol, challenges, dilemmas, and opportunities was delivered by Professor Alfred Otinyebua, the founding bureau member and former vice chair of Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services representing Africa. And more recently, a lecture titled Self and Non-Self, The Marvel of the Human Immune System was delivered by Emerita Professor Isabella Chimba Kwache, who is the Vice President of the Sciences Section of the Academy and indeed uh, the Chairperson for this event this evening. This year's topic is the science of Oware Board. Fascinating, intriguing, sending our minds to all manner of places, if you ask me. And I have no doubt, I believe all of us have no doubt that a speaker who will be introduced shortly will do justice to the topic and make the time that we all spend here this evening uh, worth our while. At this juncture, I would also like to announce that this evening's event have been supported very generously by the following organizations. The Bank of Ghana, 
Margins Group, Ghana.com, and the Cyber Security Authority. We are very grateful for this support, and with your permission, Madam Chair, I would like to say we, we, we think that uh, we will kindly ask you to applaud our sponsors on our behalf. Thank you. Now, it is my singular honor to introduce to you the chairperson for this evening's event. The chair for this evening's event in the person of Emerita Professor Isabella Achimba Kwachi, who is a professor of immunology and parasitology, University of Ghana. Professor Kwachi is the first emerita professor in the sciences at the University of Ghana. Professor Kwachi was educated at Achimota Secondary School, the 1964 year group. Professor Kwachi holds a Bachelor of Science Honors degree in Human Biology and Immunology from the University of Surrey. A Master of Science degree in Applied Immunology from Brunel University, Axbridge, Middlesex, England, and a PhD obtained in immunoparasitology in the year 1980 from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the UK. At the University of Ghana, Professor Kwachi is the first female dean of the College of Health Sciences. She is also the first female director and the foundation dean of the School of Public Health, University of Ghana. Professor Kwachi established the immunology unit at the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, 1980-1983. And aside the very high position Professor Kwachi has occupied within the university, she has also served on numerous national and international committees and boards and received several awards over many years. Some of these include being a former member of the Ghana Health Service Council and a former UNESCO Chair for Women in Science and Technology in the West African region. Professor Kwachi was also the 2014 Laureate of the Africa Union Kwame Nkrumah Award for Women in Science. She's the 2019 laureate for the Clara Savmai Ludlow Award by the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And recently, in 2019, 2021, last year, Women's World Day recognized Professor Kwachi as one of seven women in science who have changed our world for the better. I think this is also an award worthy of applause. <laughs> Professor Kwachi is a fellow and vice president, Sciences Section, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Professor Kwachi, Madam Chairperson, your audience, thank you. Thank you, Assistant Honorary Secretary, for your kind words. President of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Vice Presidents of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and will soon be joined by His Majesty Ni Noche Owu the Fourth. And all students, our students who are still joining us, 
and we have the media and all present and virtual. I know we have a, a president is uh, listening to us virtual and a number of fellows virtual um, are listening to us. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our lecturer for uh, the evening um, on an amazing topic which we are all anxious to listen to. But his bio is equally intriguing. Um, Dr. Ni Queno graduated from Dartmouth College in 1972. So this is the bio of our lecturer, Dr. Ni Nakun Queno, fellow of the Ghana Academy. He graduated from Dartmouth College in 1972 with a BA Engineering Science and received a PhD Computer Science in Distributed Systems in 1977 from Sunny at Stony Brook. He then worked with Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, in the USA from 1977 till 1992, building high performance and fault tolerance systems. He then returned to Ghana to initiate the computer science department at the University of Cape Coast in 1979 and again to establish the first ISP in West Africa, which is operated by the Network Computer Systems in 1993. He taught at microprocessor colleges of the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy, in several developing countries in the 80s. He then led the formation of several regional technical institutions of the internet in the 90s, that coordinate and administer the internet in Africa today, including African Network Operators Group, AFNOC, AFNIC, AFRINIC, Africa's Numbers Registry, a community of African CCTLDs, AFTLDs, African Research and Education Networks, AFRIN, African Accredited Registrars, AFRI Register, Organization of Sets in Africa, Africa Set, and Dota, Dot Africa Initiative. Now, Dr. Queno has served on several boards and commissions, including task force globally, and this includes ICANN, UNICT Task Force, UNIGF MAG, the Global Commission on Internet Governance, the ICANN Strategy Panel on Public Responsibility, the National IT Agency, the National Interbank Payments and Settlements System, the National Identification Authority, the Ghana News Agency, the Council of the University of Ghana, West and Central Africa and Education Network, WACRAN, and the Electronic Communications Tribunal of Ghana. We welcome His Majesty Ni Noti Owu before. Welcome, welcome. And I continue. Dr. Queno received the Internet Society's prestigious Jonathan Postal Service Award for pioneering work to advance the internet in Africa in December 2007. He was inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame in August 2013 for his pioneering role in the development of the internet in Africa. Dr. Queno also received the Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah Genius Award for Information Communication Technology in December 2014 and was also awarded the ICANN Multi-Stakeholder Ethos Award in June 2015. He is currently the chairman of the Ghana... Do Emerita Professor Isabella Kwachi, uh, President of the Academy, Emeritus Professor Samuel Sefadede, uh, Vice President of the Arts Section of the Academy, Emeritus Professor Kofi Nti, former presidents of the Academy, uh, fellows of the Academy, Honorable Ministers, Nime, Name, sponsors, media, students of the art of computing, friends and colleagues, 
family members, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to present the annual uh, lecture in the sciences and appreciate the opportunity to promote computing sciences through the academy. Uh, consider that while science is at the core of all disciplines, humans compute by default. I thank the eminent professors and fellows who propose we address the foundations of computing in Africa in this lecture. We shall explore the topic, the science of the Oware board, and we will use the familiar tablet. It's the most effective way to expose science is from things which we are familiar with around us. I would normally be speaking on the topic of technology and policy, internet, networks, distributed systems, blockchain, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, and so on, as a humble programmer. Uh, this time, I'm not. I'll be speaking about something much deeper, a forgotten scientific cultural heritage of Africa. The operation of this African calculator instrument appeals to a pan-African interest. Next slide, outline. The research presented here is the search of the foundations of computing in Africa. It's a search for roots of computer science for an African. How might Africans have done computations? This search began in 1979, and we thought it was unimaginable that Africans did not do calculations. I'm grateful to my late father, Mr. S.T. Queno, who was curious to know what a computer scientist did and ended up pointing out to me that Ake Ake Awale Boa Akunta, that is, Oware was used, it was said to be a calculator. He did not say counting. He was also quick to add he did not know how. The hint was enough and we systematically sought what theory was necessary for safe manipulation of numbers on the local Oware tablet without changes. We present the mechanical calculator starting with sharing the types of boards, tablets, what internal organization makes it work, what normal representation is necessary for positive and negative numbers, what are the basic operations you, 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 you can do, primitives, protocols, and what functions we can also implement, like adding numbers, making things negative, subtract, and other cool functions, and the games. We will not have enough time to fully develop the games but we'll share an overview. Short videos are shown to demonstrate the procedures. Normally, I work the board in live mode so that you can get a feel for it. But in this case, we'll show videos. There are several other resources. There are videos on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, under the Nikweno identifiers and you can comb the CSIT, CSIT UCC website. You can also comb nikweno.org and you'll see some things. Next slide. Generally, computer science is thought of in three areas. One big area is what we call the theory, and the next big area is the engineering, and then what we call applications each with many topics and evolving. One is typically schooled in the theory and then focuses on one of the three other areas. The theory includes familiar things like how complex is a solution to a problem, like cryptography, how to secure information, or how to um, you know, compress information, or how to do any form of uh, signing of things. We have formal methods, uh, proving things, graphs, and so forth. 
The engineering includes the equipment, the hardware, operating systems, languages, compilers, and the applications are different from what you think of applications. These are not PC applications, but they refer to things like natural languages, networks, neural networks, artificial intelligence, and so on, not your mobile apps. Although mobile apps, web apps can employ these sciences. For context, my professional field is study of, is in the engineering area, uh, operating systems, distributed systems, architecture, algorithms. While my industrial work has been in building CPUs, networks, blockchain, IoT, ATMs, and so forth. For this presentation, we shall touch concepts on Turing machines from the theory, computer architecture from engineering, AI from applications for the games. Next slide. National Game of Africa. In the literature, we find a, a book published in 1896 by a Stuart Culling at Smithsonian that enumerated games played on two, three, or four row boards with variations played across Africa, Middle East, and Asia. It did not, however, mention calculations with the board. However, an onlooker does not see, so I'm not surprised. Next slide. Counting on abacus. Abacus is another instrument predominantly used in Asia, but some schools in Ghana use it. So let's see how to represent numbers and count on abacus as background. Let's play a video. Let's see how you might count on an abacus board. This is the least significant, that is the most significant. This board has 13 digits, okay? But we start with the least. So it goes, you know, you start with zero, then you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, okay, and so forth. So if you want to represent a number like 107, then you start like this, 100, 0, 7, 107. In the same vein, if you want to do a 3,107, then you take your next digit and you go 3,107. Okay. A teaching manuscript. Next slide. Let's look at uh, the universities using this technique. Number six now. A teaching manuscript was published in 2007 on what was known from 1979 and contained the procedures and the games uh, in the programming language Pascal. So it's been public. The algorithms have been public since. And six universities from Panama, Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, and in Ghana here, University of Cape Coast use this technique. Next slide. This is the African tablets. Now, the tablets are increasingly more powerful. Uh, the one on top right is six digit. You are familiar with that, and it has two rows. And that's the West African board. The lower right one from East Africa is eight digits by four rows. The big board on the left be it on the ground, it's a board, has 12 digits, okay, in four rows, and that's from 
Central Africa. The two row can do additions and subtractions, while the four row can do additionally multiplication and division. The 12 digits is the highest precision. If you look at this board, let's say this one, it can, and you're using decimal, then it can put nothing, one, two, three, up to nine. So I can have 10 things here. So the precision is uh, 10 to the sixth. So 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. That's 10 to the sixth. So when I come here, it becomes 10 to the eighth in terms of precision. When I go here, it's 10 to the 12th. So this is more precise. And don't you see that these things are beginning to look like, um, <laughs> like a spreadsheet? So who knows? We could have used spreadsheets long ago. Next, I need some formalism. So let's look at a Turing machine. We're going to do a little bit of formalism to continue. And a good starting point is the definition of an automaton uh, called Turing machine. The machine has a control with a finite set of states and can also read an infinite tape and put some symbols. The point here is that the way to read this is the way to read, uh, what happened to you? Okay, I can't quite, ah, there you go. The way to read this is, I have a finite control. It has a fixed number of states. And the way it works is that he can read a symbol here. Okay, and he has an infinite tape. So that's all. He has a fixed number of things he can remember and he has fixed number of symbols that he can remember. The symbols are described in some symbol here called gamma, okay? And all he says is that he looks at this, and depending on what state he's in, he decides to move, you know, left or right. He decides to change a symbol or not. So everything here is like, if I'm in this state and I see this, I do that. If I'm in this state and I see a particular symbol, all that is written here. It, because he has multiple outputs, it's not a function. Technically, it's a mapping. So if I'm in a state and I see a particular input, I'll go to another state and I might print something on the, on the tape and I might move left or right. So all the programs there look something like this. If I happen to be in state Q1 and there's a Y written on the, on the tape, I'll go to a Q1 or a Q2 or a Q3, whatever it is, and put a different symbol or the same Y and move left or right. So this set of things we call transitions become the programs, okay? And we need this formalism to go on. Next slide. Okay. Now, this particular machine that we referred to, it took us away from uh, the informal notion of procedures where you, you sort of do hand waving now a program must be precise. It has to tell you exactly what you have to do depending on what input you get and what he is trying to do. And this then became the main method of uh, proving many, many major things such as what, what machines can recognize in terms of languages or even what things are undecidable. Like you cannot make a machine that will tell whether every other machine works or not. That's like playing God. So let's look at the uh, next slide, which has to do with the board description. So with this formalism, we would like to be precise when we are talking about a particular digit, a particular digit among the numbers. And so we use the notion of having a, a two-dimensional array. You have two, you know, one number here, one number there. And you can talk about the digits, okay, of the first row, the digits least significant on your right, most significant on your left. I have two of them. We call the first one the source, and then we call the second one the result. The hint here is that when we do manipulation here, we'll always keep the result in the second row. And that's, that side cuff that you have, we turn it into a work area, uh, and then the one on the right, you keep as many stones as you need there. Next one. So there must be some internal way you think about it in order for us to be able to 
do the manipulation. This is called the internal organization or sometimes the architecture. The structure that makes it work is the architecture. And the source register in this case is read only. Okay? You have a read only source and then a register that is both read and write. So your output will always come to the second row. What I'm suggesting here is that you have a state, as you saw in the other machine. What digit am I working on? I'm working on the first digit, the second digit, the sixth digit is remembered here. We are doing addition. Where do we do our calculations? It's in the work area. Where do we get the ability to write numbers? You have to find stones. You have to get pebbles. So internally, this is your you know, organization. You have read only, and you have read write as results. Next one. So there must be some rules. If we don't have rules, then you haphazardly be playing with the numbers, and you'll never be sure where you are. So the rules are simple. Okay? The first row, you cannot change it. But the second row, you can change it, but only the particular way. This is constraining your behavior on the board so that you don't drop stones all over the place, you don't make mistakes. So notice that in this scenario, you can only write a number into the two rows. Okay? The star here means it can be the source, or it can be the result. So you can, I can write any six digits there. That's all this says. You see the power of notation. Simply by choosing this notation, you are able to say that I can write any number in the two rows. What this is saying is that the first row, which is where you have your uh, source, you don't touch it. You cannot change it. So you can only make copy of it. Not to put the copy anywhere. You can only put the copy into the, the side hole the side pocket there, the one we are calling the work area, that's the only place you can put it. And you are allowed to remove all the stones in the second row, but you can only put them in the work area, which is the cap on your left. So once you've got a copy of the first digit there and a copy of the second there, you can now decide, is it more than 10? If it's more than 10, then you might have a carry. It's the same thing you do when you're adding two numbers, isn't it? You add it, and then when it's bigger than 10, you put a carry on top. Instead of putting a carry on top, we put a carry on the side bell, on the, on, on, on the cup that's on the side. And then you make these decisions, meaning that if you look at it and it's more than 10, you have to remove what is left of it and put it in the result. So whatever is beyond the 10, you put it in the result. That's the answer. Then you keep your carry, and the rest of the stones, you take it back so you can write another number. That's all we are saying. So the notation is allowing us to explain this thing precisely. You can write any number in the two rows, but you can only make a copy of the first row digits and only into a work area. As for the second row, you are allowed to remove the stones, but it can only go into a work area. Once it's gone to the work area, then you must make a decision. Do you have more than 10? If you have more than 10, the things above there are the answer. The things above there is the answer. Then you remember your carry, take your stones back. But if it's less, then your answer is whatever is in the work area. So you put it there and you look at the numbers, remove the excess, answer. If it's less than 10, answer. And that's it. Next one. Okay. So now, we're going to look at the mechanics of doing the addition. The way you do it is you look at this digit, that digit from the rightmost. You make a copy to the work area. Now you remove all the stones to the work area. Then you say, is it bigger than 10? The excess is part of the answer. Leave one stone, the rest of the stones you take away. That's what we're saying we're doing. How do we describe it in computer science? We say we start with nothing in the work area. We have no carry. You need to get as many stones as you can find because you want to write all the possible numbers. Then starting from the rightmost, the least significant, the smallest side, like you write numbers, starting from there, you now do the two things we said we would do. We make a copy of that digit to the work area. We remove the stones from the second row into the work area. 
then you ask yourself, that's decision. You ask yourself, is it more than 10? If it's more than 10, then the answer is, of course, the excess. Then you must remember the carry, like just as you do in addition, and then take your stones back. But if you look at it and it's less than 10, then whatever is in the work area is the answer that you must put in your results. This is how we describe it precisely, to the extent that even a machine can follow. So this is straightforward. Starting digit by digit, make a copy, remove the other stones from the second row, add them together in the cup, then you look at the cup. Is it bigger than 10? If it is bigger than 10, then your answer uh, is the excess. Then you must remember you have a carry, then right, take your stones back. If it's less, then whatever is there is the answer. Next one. Okay. Next one, please. I mean, I want to show you a video now. This is number 13. Yeah. Let's watch the video. A negative number is one which when you add two is positive, you get zero. So if, for instance, we had nine... I think you've gone too far. I want to see the addition. This should be exactly slide number 13. This is... You've gone too far. If I don't I show you addition, you can't that do that the next one. Here. Subtraction. No. If you want to subtract two numbers, subtract what is a negative number? A negative number is one which when you add two is positive, you get zero. So if for instance please please stop the video. Find the right one. You you've gone too far. Follow my slides. I just covered addition. I want to show addition video. If you are to repeat with the same thing, you end up with zero, 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 zero. zero. So nine, 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 representing now. It should, it should show as number thirteen incrementally. I just finished with. Um, uh, number 12, which is add the two rows. This looks like the number one. We must first pack with minus This eight looks like the number four. 41. Then you can put 15 up there. And this looks like 241. If you want minus 8, this looks like 5,241. And then yes. you will set up on the second row. This looks like 15,000. 240. Go from the beginning. This looks like 315,000. Mm -hmm. That's 9. 9, nine. So, imagine so you can write because this is 8 and this is 9. The yes. difference is a 1. So you must collect so you all of two numbers stones and leave and only you can one. try to add the two numbers. So this is a situation yeah, where you are trying to add 41 and the zero to do that, nine, you zero take the one from nine, here nine, because nine, nine, nine. So nine, nine, this nine, one nine, will nine, not change, one, but you put that's the answer. difference. Okay. So you make a copy and you collect all these here. It's less than 10, so this is part of the answer. You make a copy. Okay. So your answer is now 50. 
we may try two different numbers because you have to set up the board. So if I were to, for instance, um, make this That's seven, eight, and then make this four, forty-four, forty-four, and fifty-eight. Let's see the addition. You start with this, make a copy. That's four. Then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That means these are part of the answer, and you leave a stone here. Then make a copy of the four, add it to this, and that's five. Then you go six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That means this is zero here. And you leave one stone. Then you make a copy of the zero, take all the zero, so 102. That is your addition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Worth waiting for. Okay. So Let's now move on to the next slide um, and, and look at the instruction hierarchy. This is number 14. Number 14, number 14. Right, right. So now that we've been able to, using these primitives, the basic things of making copy and moving things and so on, and you've created this adder. There are more things you can create, even higher. So the next thing is to show you how to work your way to negative numbers. And the step to go into negative numbers is to have something we call the difference. Okay. And you'll see that. But once you have that, I can create up counter, down counter. Then I can do subtraction. If I have negative numbers, the same addition will do subtraction for me. Then if I have two boards, I can let them do two additions, so I can do multiplication, I can do division. And if I stack up many, many boards, I can actually do programming at the top there. This is really where we are working our way to. Next one. Yeah. So if I do not allow you to write plus or minus on the side, but we have only six digits, how do we represent positive and negative numbers? This is the next subject, and we'll spend two slides on it. The first slide is to take a look at, for one digit, if I have just one digit, and I can write from zero to nine stones, what is negative and what is positive? And you determine it like this. If I have a, a, you know, a zero, then clearly zero. And if I have one, it's one. If I have two, up to four. So these are how you write normal positive numbers, zero, one, two, three, four in that digit. For the negative numbers, okay, we take nine as minus one, and then eight as minus two, seven. So if you see seven on the, on the board, and it has at the leftmost, then it means these are negative numbers. Okay. Why do we say that? A negative number is one which when you add uh, you know, two is positive, you get zero. So if I were to, for instance, add the three and the seven, notice that the seven is supposed to be minus three, I get zero. And a carry, of course, but I get zero. And the same applies to the four and it's six. The six is supposed to be it's negative. And if I do that, then I also get zero. So clearly, that's the case. Now, you wonder how do you get these numbers? Very simple. You, let's say you're looking for minus three. You start with nine, and then the number three you want. Take the difference, it gives you a six. Add one to it, seven. So that's your negative of three. And you do this repeatedly, repeatedly. Next one. So now the question is, supposing I have multiple, okay, multiple digits, how do I rationalize the same thing? So if I want to look for minus 1957, of course, 1957 is very important to us. We start with all nines. This is on the overall board, huh? six, six, you, you know, the same six digits, nine, 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 and you put your 1957 here, then you do a difference. Nine minus seven is two. Nine minus five is four. Nine and nine is zero. 
918, okay? But that's like the complement. You have to add one to it to get a negative number. And you can begin to see that it's actually a negative number. Because if I add the three and the seven, I get a zero and a carry. Then if I add the four and the five and a carry, I get a zero and a carry. So if I add a nine and a zero and a carry, I get zero, you know? Then it pops off one more, you know? And then if I, if, if I continue, it all becomes zero, okay? This is what's going on. So the carry, then, then the whole thing becomes, so that's negative. We can look at another way. If I take this number here and put it here and go through the same process, you see I get 1957 because I do the same way. I get six, I get five, I get nine, I get one, I add one, and you can see it's 1957. So this is the negative of, of this for sure. Next one. So we can manage multiple digits. The next step is to implement this thing we call diff. Okay? Then we can add a one. So if you do the diff, the answer, remember the answer will be in the second row. It will be in the second row. So I look at the two rows and I put the difference in the second row. That's all. That's all I do. But that is written precisely like this. Put this number in the first row. Then put the number you are looking for, its difference in the second row. And then you subtract these two, the 9 and the N1, the 9 and the N2, and so on, up to the 9 and the N6. Okay, that's what you want to do. How do we do it? We do it like this. I go from digit 1 to digit 6, and I look at the difference. Notice that this is the first row, that's the second row, digit by digit. I just take the difference among them and call it the result. And that's all. So the result ends up in the second row. The same way that you normally do any kind of addition. Okay. So now let's look at the next slide. Okay. How you do the actual negate. We know you do the difference and you add one. But let's see how you do it. So if you understand, appreciate that the difference is as easy as putting 9999, and then you put your number you want there, and you do this and, and take the difference, then you can accept that if I write this, this is what it means. Anytime I write diff, it means you put nine in the first row and the number you're looking for in the second row, and you make the difference so that the second row contains the difference. Then you can always put one at the top, which is what this does. This statement here puts one at the top, and so if you just do the normal addition, which you saw earlier, then you have a negative number. So maybe we can take a look at how you do negative numbers. Video, video. This should be slide 19. So if, for instance, we had nines in these rows, okay. Okay. Nine, nine. so imagine there are nine nines here. If you were to add one to it, notice what happens. You make a copy of this one, then you remove all these nine and add to this, it becomes 10. So it means that zero will come here, and that leaves one here. If you are to repeat with the same thing, you end up with zero, 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 zero. So 999 is certainly the negative of one. So how do you go about discovering negative numbers? Let's say you want to find minus three. In the same way, you put nines here, okay? Put nines here, okay. good. So what you do is, because you are looking for negative of this, you will take the difference first. And when you take the difference, it becomes this. 
in this case take the difference of this is nine difference of this is nine so you have nine 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 and then here you have six so that's the difference that's the current of complement okay what you must do now to get the tens tens complement similar to two's complement you have to add one and you know how we add one in this case you can even do a shortcut and add it here so you can see that nine 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 and seven okay is a negative of three which you can you can prove simply by attempting to add three okay and in this case you collect three into the stone into the working area then you have exactly seven here so it end up becoming ten so you get zero back and one here and if you continue then all of this will become zero 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 so you have discovered how you go about finding negative numbers all right thank you so now let's now look at how you do the subtraction so subtraction um, this should be number 20 good so since we know how to do the difference how to do negate and how to do addition we can now simplify the procedure if i say do sub and negate we all know what it means it means you first do a difference and then you add one and the answer will be in the second row always in the second row so in this case we say we describe it precisely by saying that make sure there's no stone in the work area no previous carry then as many stones as you can work with. And then it tells you do a negate. Okay, the minus B that you are looking for, create it first, but in the second row. Because if you can create it in the second row, it's very easy. Just move your A into the first row, and then you can add them, because you are now very familiar with this addition here. So here it says negate. That means you first must do a difference, 9999, then the number you want, take the difference, remove the nines, put a one there, add it. Okay? So you've got your negative B sitting inside the second row. That's where you always have your result. So with that, you can now just put the A in the first row, and then you are ready to do the addition. The same method you do the addition, make a copy, remove the stones, make a decision, and put the digits, etc., etc. Same. Next one. Okay, so now we should be about ready to watch a video on subtract. So you can see all the procedures the first have together. B with the results in the second row. Then you can load A up there and do the addition. So if you want to find out what is 15 minus 8, then you must first calculate minus 8 in the second row. Then you can put 15 up there and add. So let's try to do that. If you want minus 8, that's 8. And then you will set up on the second row all nines, nines. That's 9. And that's 9. 9, 9, nine. So we imagine there are 9, nines here. Because this is 8 and this is 9, the difference is a 1. So we must collect all of these stones and leave only 1. And we are done with this digit. 0 difference is 9. 0 difference is 9999. So 9 That's the difference. This is like your complement. And the next thing you must do is to add 1 to it to make it dead equivalent of the two's complement in our case tens complement so if we add one you can see that the answer is nine two nine 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 two so that's minus eight the next step is to write your 15 and then you want to add the 15 okay so you take a copy of five 
which is your five stones. Take this. It's, that's so your answer for the first digit is this. Then you take the copy of the one, which if you add a nine will make it ten, then it becomes zero. Then when you add this, it becomes zero, 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 zero. So the answer that we have is seven. Okay, which is correct. And that is how you do subtraction. Thank you. All right. So let's look at. Let, let's be daring. If you can, let, let's be daring. If we can come this far, maybe we can do multiplication. All right. We can do multiplication. Now, multiplication really it uses uh, successive additions. Okay. So if I have to multiply two numbers, I take the large one, I add it to itself as many times as the small one, then I can get my answer, okay? So you have to set up your boards okay. in such a way that you are able to do that. It takes two boards. So one board counting down and one board accumulating the, the, the answer, okay? So you have one accumulating the answer by adding to itself and one counting how many times I've already done it. Okay. So in this case, you see here board one, board one is set to have minus one as the first row, and the B, we are doing A times B. So the B is here, and if you have minus one in the B, every time you add, it will become less, right? It will keep going lower and lower. And when it becomes zero, you stop. So on that same OWARI board, I can put minus one on the top row, and then the B, I want to multiply on the second row, and I'll count it down. So this is a down counter. Then on the other side, I'm doing a sum. So I'll set it up so that the answer is zero to start, and I put the A in the first row. So every time I come now, I'll do this and I'll do that. I'll do this and I'll do that. I do the two boards, okay? And that is described here. Assume that I will loop forever until I quit. And I quit only when this guy becomes zero, okay? So if I come around and I see that this is zero, I don't do anything. I stop altogether. So in this case, it becomes like this. For this board, you check if it is zero, quit. If not, just do an addition. It will reduce this by one. And then at the same time, right after that, you do the sum on the board two. You just do a normal addition that you do on the two row board. When it quits, your answer is gonna be on the board two, the second row, because you kept adding this to itself. Okay, so multiplication has now been broken into just additions on the two boards. <laughs> Next slide. So, next slide. We should play a video to see this at play. It should be number 23. Oh, board. Notice that the variant is different. You are familiar with the two row boards, which are prevalent in Western Africa. This one, four row boards, are prevalent in Eastern and Central Africa. Because it has more rows, it can do more complicated things than the two rows can do. In this case, if you look at the board representation, you have eight digits, and then you have two rows, two rows, which you can use to do different sets of addition, each of them giving a result on the second register. So if you want to do three times two, you will set up the board like this. You put three stones in the first row. So these two rows do the addition to keep the cumulative sum. And these two rows will do the subtraction to know the number of times that you have done the addition to itself. So A times B, you put A here, you put B here, and you put zero here to keep the sum, and you put minus one here to do the down counter which you've seen before. So in this example, three times two is very simple. First, we have to do the, the two operations, one after the other, and we keep doing until we become, this becomes zero. So in this case, we are doing the first one, which is to add three to zero, and the answer is this. 
Then the next one is to do the subtraction. So we want to do addition of minus 1 and 2. In this case, this is 9, so I have 9 here. I just take this one, it becomes 10, and I drop one stone here. Then I come again with 9, and I take this, I leave 0 here, and I drop one stone here. I come again with 9, and I take this, and I drop here. These are all 9, so I can continue like that with 0, 0, 0, 0. So we come the second time. The second time, we do the same thing. We take a copy of this and just add a shortcut. And then we take our nine stones normally, okay? Instead of putting it here, we notice if you add it, it's 10. There's nothing else. So this is zero, and I drop a stone here. I come back with the same nine, okay? I add a zero. I drop one. Zero. I drop one. All the way. So now we've reached the end. At this point, we must finish because we've counted down to zero. And so the answer must be in the second rule, which says that it's six. Three times two is six. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe let's venture again. Let's try and do division. Yeah. I think it's, we're, go we're getting the hang of it. It's just addition. Once your machine can do addition, you can do addition many times and create almost any kind of mathematical function. This is what we are driving towards. So to do that, I need to remind you um, what a negative number is. So if you give me six digits, I only go and look at the leftmost digit. And if it has one of those numbers we designate as negative numbers, then we we'll describe the whole number as negative. Much the same as you do in digital circuit. If you're looking for negative, you go to the extreme, you know, maybe B32, and you look at the bit there, if it's a one, it's a negative number, okay? Same thing we'll do here. So in this case, to call something negative, you go to that sixth digit, and you check whether it is one of these numbers, which we described earlier as representing negative. In that case, the sign is negative. And this is only for, for us to know precisely when we see a negative number. Next one. So if we know a negative number, then we can now talk about division. Okay? In this case, we want to divide A by B. So how many times can I subtract B from A? How many times can I subtract B from A? And I count it. If I subtract, I count. I subtract, I count. If I subtract it becomes negative, I don't count it, okay? But if I can see ahead that it's going to become negative, then I have my remainder also, okay? But if you don't want your remainder, you can just subtract. When you see that it's negative, you stop, okay? And this is the procedure we'll do. So once again, uh, we're going to do successive subtraction. We need two boards, two of the traditional boards. No change, two boards. So what we do is we set up one to count the number of times we have successfully subtracted. And we know how to do that. The top row of board one is one. The second row is zero. So every time I do this, this will become one, two, three, four. That's an up counter. It's like a clock, okay? So I'm counting how many times I've done. Every time I'm made to run, it will increase by one. And then the other one, I'm trying to subtract. So I must set my top to be the negative of what I want to divide with. So I'll take your B, then I'll put it, the negative of it in the first row. Then I put the A in the second row. So every time I come, I'll do, you know, minus B to whatever the sum here is. In so doing, at some point, this will become negative. And when it becomes negative, you know you must quit. But if you can look at the number and see that if you subtract, it's going to become negative, uh -huh, then you have the remainder sitting there at this point. So what is the procedure? The procedure says we're going to do it forever until we quit. Okay? And then you do some work with the first board, okay, which is this one. You try to subtract. Okay? And then you do work with the second board, you try to count. So we are counting up how many times we have successfully subtracted here. So you are going to get your quotient 
in the result register here, okay, and you get your remainder here. That's what we're trying to do. Can we see a video division? A by B, then you want to get a quotient and a remainder. You get the quotient by counting number of times you successfully subtracted B from A. Okay, and when you are no more able to do a subtraction, what you have there is the remainder. So, as an example, if you want to do five divided by two, then you have to calculate minus two to put in the top row so you can put five here and then you're going to have to put a one and a zero so you can count the number of times you've been able to successfully divide so to generate minus two the technique said that you put two here and nines so that's a set of nines So we have five, that's nine, correct? Nine. So you have nine, 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 nine here. And normally, because you have two here, you take out two. And then you want to add one to it. Okay, so it becomes nine, 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 eight is the same as minus two. So we said we put the minus B in the top row. So we have our minus B in the top row, and you can see it's 99998. Then we have to put the A in the second row, and the A is 5. So you have 5 there. So now the board is fully set up. You have minus B on top, you have A in the second row, and you have 1 and a 0. And what you're going to do is every time you come around, you do both additions both additions until when you can no longer do the addition okay and i'll explain it to you so you are doing your successive subtraction in the first two rows and you are counting the number of times you've been through so the quotient will be the answer here and the remainder will end up here so let's try so if i have set up the board correctly and i have eight I will go successfully and add them up like normal. So 8, that means it's a 9 and a 10. So the 3 is part of the answer and I drop 1 here. So if I come with 9, okay, and I add, then this becomes 0, 0, 0, 0. So in the first round, I'm able to subtract 1. So I have to now do the addition of the second adder. So that becomes this. Then I come again. In this case, I will still be carrying my 8. Okay. I will still have my 8. And I go 9 and 10. That means this is part of the answer. And I drop a stone here. So 9 and a 1, I'll get 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. Once I'm successful in doing the first adder, I must do the second adder, which is add 1 to this. So it's 2. So at this point, if I do any further subtraction, this will become a negative number. So you can see that the quotient is in the, is in the row here, last row, and the remainder is in the second row. Okay, And that's an example of how you do division on the worry board. Thank you. So we're going to switch now. I need to touch on the games a little bit. So I have some, just five slides and then we are done. Uh, so this research attempted to catalog the known games, the games that we play that we were familiar with. And we also want to uh, catalog the rules, then the algorithms, the actual procedures for doing the search and finding the good moves and so on, and actual implementations. So in, let's look at the history of the game's implementation. Next slide, 28. Good. So uh, these have generally been two-person games, meaning a human user versus a device. Okay. And the first version was in 1983, and it used Pascal programming language. 
and they are, you know, they were widely available on machines that uh, run Pascal, uh, but typically VAX VMS and uh, systems had them, and they use, uh, you know, normal, uh, you know, user interface for terminal like VT100. That time we didn't have pixel graphics. There are three games and a calculator in our catalog. And you can get a copy of these, you know, on any of the sites I've mentioned. You can get a copy of the game. Uh, the actual source in the book itself, in the Oware book, it has the source for Pascal there. There's a C version also in which the two games are playing against each other, okay? Um, and then if you want running programs, you can get some of them at uh, at least the iPhone store because I work in C. So that's the only reason. And the C is a natural port of the Pascal into that programming language. The third wave came around 2000 uh, with some of these mobile phones coming and then we ported it again to Objective-C and you can get some of the Objective-C programs there. Let's look at Next slide, the games in Ghana. At least let's get a comparative view. The games, you know, they are generally the same in the sense that the board setup is all 4444, okay? And uh, the basic move is also the same because you collect stones and you drop one, one until your hands become empty. And you go counterclockwise. None of them go clockwise. They always go counterclockwise. So that's the structure of the games that are played uh, within our vicinity. But they also vary uh, on whether you are allowed to continue after the basic move of dropping a stone each. Yeah. And then the termination and the winning rules are also different. Okay. Some of them, you have to go to somebody's land to win. For some of them, you must win on your own land. Okay. And in some cases, the rules allow, uh, depending on uh, who the player is, to win the rest of the stones. Next slide. So let's look at the comparison. This is a, a very quick view, but it summarizes everything for you. Notice that we're comparing these three games okay, along the lines of whether they allow you to continue when your basic move ends, or, and also how you win as well as how you terminate. In the case of the most common one, which is the 4 4 uh, you are allowed to continue. So when you make your move and your hands become empty, if the, there are more than one stones there, you are allowed to collect it and continue. That's what we mean by continuation. In the case uh, of Abapa, you are not allowed to continue. There's no continuation but they have a, a different quirk. If the stones in your hand that you are dropping one by one is more than 12, you drop, you have to skip the 12th hole, a twist in the, in the rules. And then there's another one which we call go round and round and round, but Nadole or something like that is the name. It allows you to continue, okay? Now, in the area of winning, it's also interesting. In the case of the 4-4, four four, okay, you tend to win things on the lands that you own. Except when you drop your last stone on a four, or to make four, it doesn't matter whether it's your land or the opponent's land. So you can actually win wherever. But in the case of Abapa, you have to win at the opponent's land. This is what is described here. Meaning the place where you dropped your last stone became two or three, and it is not you, it is not your land. This is not, this index here is not your land. It's not your land, okay? Uh, then you can win the two, three, but you can also win the consecutive ones leading up to where your stone dropped, okay? Then on this one, you win only when you end on your own land. And you can see that is also captured here it tells you that if where you ended up, the, the C for where you ended up, the row for where you ended up uh, is, uh, is you, then you can win the stones at the other side. So you win the stones at the opponent's side uh, if you went round and round and ended up on your own land. So interesting twist. Then how do they terminate? The popular one terminates whenever you have 
you know, 44 stones have been consumed, the last one is usually given to the player. Okay? And the case of, um, uh, this also is given to the player for Abapa, but there it's when you have nine stones left. That's when you te terminate. And the one that you go round and round and round, you terminate it much the same as you do with uh, the uh, 1990. But the difference is that we each take our stones. You know, as if the four stones are all in the opponent's side, uh, he takes the stones. It's not you, unlike the case of 1990. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. So, uh -huh. so, notice that even when we didn't have all these pixel graphics, you are still able to represent the board. You are still able to represent the game. I'm using this to point out to you that the UI is not the answer, but the, the algorithm, the logic behind is the answer. Even with the tiniest UI, we are able to tell what's going on. In this case, you know that this is one, the computer side, Okay, Com you know, computer has a side, and this is the user side, user versus device. It's properly numbered like your games are numbered, and it has some tabulation of the scores. And in this case, if the computer says he's moving position one, he doesn't just do it. He waits for the human being to tell him go, so that we can follow what he's doing. Otherwise, you cannot follow. So you can see, you can actually do lots of next one. Okay, I've abstracted out a lot just so that I can be able to communicate it, okay? But you can imagine there's more detail. Now I'm showing you how to build a game, but um, the games are there, you can go and get your copy, but I want to show you how to build a game. First, you have to train your, 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 your software, the program you're writing, to know about how you go around. And it's very easy, because you keep on increasing, you know, the eye, until you reach the six, and you're going to become seven, then you should know that you should be switching to the other row. So you just have to do some checks to make sure that you follow the, the rotation cycle correctly. Then as you're going around in your counterclockwise, you must check the winds and check the termination and then check whether you are allowed to continue. That's all. Okay, so if you can figure out how to take the stones from a, a chosen position, okay, this position, IJ, and then drop one, 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 one every time as you go around and you do it according to your counterclockwise, you can just check these and you are okay. It's not that many lines of code anyway. Next slide. So the next thing is to teach you how to expand the board, okay? Whereas somebody tells you here's a board, and there are positions you can play. And every position you play gives you a new board. Right? Every position you play should end up with a new board. So you must have a value for a quality of a board. Some boards have more wins than you know, losses. And some boards also have good position, placement of stones. We call all those things heuristics. Okay. So you must have some basic heuristics. Let's say we are just looking at the wins for the computer minus the wins for the player. If that is the case, then you can expand your board like this. Try all the boards. So I start with one, and I, I expand it, and I get six different boards. Right? Because I try all the six positions. Each of them leads to a new board. Then I take each of this, those six, and I expand them also. So I will alternate me, the computer playing, with computer playing for the player, and then the computer playing again, and the computer playing for the player, so that he expands the board, alternating like you're normally supposed to do in the game. In so doing, you then can look at the quality of the boards, and then inform yourself backwards. But this is how you do it. Notice that the definition of the program that we evaluate a board tells it who is playing, okay, that's the C here, and how many moves ahead you want it to look, okay? But I can look forever, but let's say I say I'm looking three moves ahead. Okay. But that definition also 
refers to himself is what we call recursive. And if I'm here, I have to show you recursion. Okay? So to define this one, I refer to myself. But with a new board, a new player, okay, and a smaller number of moves. So if I came in with N, I'll call him to look again with one less. So I can actually prove for you uh, in formal methods that this thing will terminate at some point because I cannot keep calling myself forever. Every time I call myself, this thing gets reduced by one. So I'm called to evaluate the board. What I do is I say for all valid moves on that board, I create a new board. Maybe I make the move. Okay? Then after I've made a move, I check whether I've reached the end or I've reached the depth. Okay? If I have, then I'll give a value to the board because I've reached the terminal point. So I should know the value of the board and I'll use it later here. Okay? So for each of them, you'll be keeping which one is best, which one is best, at least for this all valid moves, you'll be keeping which one is best, which one is best here. In case you didn't quite reach the end, and so this if did not work, then you must do this. So if you haven't reached the end, and therefore you don't know the value of the board, then you must call yourself again uh, and change the player and reduce the number of moves and ask him to look again. But every time he comes back, you keep what you consider was a good position. Okay. At the end of all of these movements, okay, then you return what you consider the best position for the board. So in essence, you expand all the board as deep as you can go, then you put values on them. When you are coming back, you know which particular position gave you the best. And that is why it gives you the value and which position. So this function here returns which value and which position. I'm sure you've seen this thing with uh, your chairs and the like, but perhaps this is the first time you are seeing it with uh, Owari. Let's look at the next slide. Okay. Now, I'd like to conclude, but if I may, uh, you know, take, Madam Chair, if I can take a few minutes and conclude by a shout out to a few organizations and persons, and um, then give my closing remark. I pay tribute to late Professor F.K. Alote for recognizing a talent in this science and investing in the capacity. We are grateful and will pass the same on to others to build a stronger scientific society. I come from Osu and I'm grateful to see our chief Ni Noche Owo the fourth and his entourage, including the head of the Queen of family. I would like to express a shout out to my spouse Sewa and son Norte of Autism Center Fame Act. I thank you for your immense sacrifices living through the painful technology revolution. To our sponsors, Bank of Ghana, Margins, Ghana.com, and uh, Cyber Security Authority. Uh, we appreciate your general support for this presentation. Science costs a lot, but makes excellent long-term investments, and we applaud you heartily. In fact, if we don't urgently invest in computer science departments at the universities, we could soon outsource all technical operations in Ghana's industry overseas. These same inadequately resourced departments have nonetheless produced majority of technical workforce in the country. I conclude with these words. Abandoning our scientific cultural heritage weakens our ability to domesticate modern computational sciences. Without the confidence from legacy, we will naturally tend to wait for global consensus to act, and that will keep us 
in the digital divide forever. We engaged in a techno liberation struggle in the 90s to ensure technology domination was prevented in global policy coordination. And we largely succeeded. Unfortunately, Africa seems happy to be users and not providers. I hope that knowing we have a forgotten computational heritage will motivate us to take real ownership. Please teach our calculus to someone else. It's simply beautiful. Thank you very much for your attention. I, th I think we can do better than this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Quino. This is like the magic of science simplified. Um, really, I, I felt like I was in the magical land and I was trying to find my feet and this has just been tremendous, tremendous. Now you can agree with me, it's not possible to summarize this kind of talk. But I, I can you know, tease out a few things that I, 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 I in the take home messages. Um, so he started off by saying science is at the core of all disciplines. And uh, to think that, you know, we have the game, a simple game played in Ghana that their roles underline the algorithms and that are worthy of preserving computer science and cyberspace. You know, how this kind of environment among children, can you imagine a hundred children seated around Dr. Queno with a no worry? Just, you know, and over time, you can see them all on computer and developing programs and uh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, fantastic. Uh, this evening has just been amazing. Um, so he started by saying this, the Owari, it's like a computer science that is waiting to be discovered or you know, really to be expanded. And we have a scientific cultural heritage of Africa and we shouldn't wait for someone to tell us we have it. We have it and we have to evolve it and, and make sure that it helps us in our developmental agenda. Um, he talks about the African computation and calculations and uh, you know, how it evolved for him, how Owari was used as a calculator. You know, and we all know what calculators meant. You, know, you calculate and it's futuristic. Um, so he talked about the mechanical, the, the calculator, um, the, the um, various areas uh, that I got, the theory, you know, the three main areas, the, the theory, that is the complex solutions, the engineering, that's the hardware, and the application that alludes to the AI. And then the nature of the game, you know, I, I, you know, I wasn't aware there's other aspects of our So this was a really a learning. Um, and then he goes through the you know, technical, the formalisms, as the transition programs, and the, pre the precision. I mean, we, we clearly saw the precision. And, and you have to have a language. You can't just play around. You have to have a language in doing things. And then the dimensional array, the digitization, the, what he calls the internal organization. That's the architect. You know, I can see a, a, you know, a, one of our greatest architects here. Before you can plan anything big, you have to have an internal organization and have the architecture of the thing. So there's the digitizing, the calculations, the internal organizations, and then you have to work with rules. It looks as if we're working, we're, we're, we're in our, our country is leading to a rule-less country. We need rules, we have to develop rules. And there's the first rule that's unchangeable, that is static, and then the second set of rules that's changeable. And then uh, the mechanisms of additions, and this is how you know, you can excite the children to see that, yes, the Pascal language can evolve from, you know, Owari. And then, you know, um, 
in, and, and uh, where from the uh, uh, Pascal, the C programming, and our current you know, uh, uh, version of the user language. And uh, we can relate to the 1990, the Obapa and Nandole. But uh, basically, in summary, he shows the implementation of the uh, uh, worry of algorithms of a common game played on the board. Summary, I, I've tried to just show the excitement. I, I'm so excited that I think we have to have you as part of our team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we go around high schools and, you know, uh, the fellows go around high schools and teach the special programs. And I think we've got a worthy fellow to be part of that program. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all too soon, I think we've come to the end of what we believe we would all agree is a super, to borrow an expression, super exciting event. I will kindly, I believe it's in order to say that let's give our distinguished lecturer a formal round of applause to acknowledge us. And Madam Chairperson, Professor, Emerita Professor Kwachi, we thank you very much for uh, this very comprehensive and insightful summary of what we, we will say is a very complicated subject. So uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we would like to say thank you first and foremost to all of you for making the time to be here and be present for this event. Uh, certainly, uh, Professor Quino has acknowledged the distinguished dignitaries present. We have here uh, fellows of the academy, senior administrators, academics from our universities. And we do also have um, the chief of OSU, elders, and the delegates in the presence of, um, in the person of um, His Royal Majesty Ni, uh, Professor Noche Note Owo the fourth. We also do have in our midst um, Presbyterian Secondary School, Presec, Ganata Secondary School, Accra Academy, and student from Cape Coast University Computer Science Department. I think we, you, you are all very welcome. And um, yeah, thank you. So in the introductory section, uh, we provided a, a background of academy and its various lectures and activities. And it is my singular pleasure at this moment to announce that there is an upcoming event 
which is an inaugural lecture to be delivered by Professor Kofi Kwashiga, who is a fellow of the academy and a former a dean of the University of Ghana uh, School of Law. The topic of his lecture is Fidelity to Constitutional Values, Key to National Survival. And the date of the lecture is Thursday, October 13, 2022, at 5.30 p.m. We are all um, respectfully invited to be present at the lecture. At this juncture, I think uh, I am also informed to uh, let us all know that there are uh, refreshments which will be in the foyer as we exit from this uh, auditorium, and we are all um, heartily welcome to have some refreshment on our way out. I also would like to kindly, respectfully request that as the platform party makes room, uh, ready to recess from the auditorium that we are all um, asked to kindly stand up as that event goes. So thank you very much.